have you guys had that thing happen where you say a word like over and over and it starts to lose all meaning for you? Um, yeah. Tell, tell us what semantic satiation is. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, have right. uh, yeah. I have. And I guess I think that what happened, like when I was reading about it, what happens is like, so when you first say a word, it's designed to direct your attention to an idea. Um, but if your attention is already on the idea and you keep saying the word, then you start to realize that the word is not the thing, that those sounds have actually really nothing to do with that thing. And then it slowly becomes gibberish and it starts to mean nothing to you. Um, and then it's like, whoa, like it's like a mind work thing. Um, and we've all experienced something similar with our relationship to God at times where through repetition, uh, things that may have rung really true at another time becomes something that we feel nothing about. Um, something that was really deep to us before might feel like a platitude, a song that we were weeping at five years uh, earlier. Now we hear it, we're like, that's the corniest thing. I can't believe anyone could ever listen to that. Um, and in itself, that's not a very big deal, but it can often be the canary in the coal mine for a position of heart uh, that where there is a there is a deeper change happening, um, where we're becoming more disillusioned with Christianity and then eventually more disillusioned with God. Um, and so, in the in the language of the emo emotionally healthy spirituality book, you are likely hitting a wall, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Is when when you hit a wall, and um, so that's a, that's a minor version of hitting a wall, but there are these much more major versions also. And the wall is a crisis that makes you question God. That's what it is. That's the definition of the wall. It's a crisis that makes you, uh, make, makes you question God. And it can be initi initiated by a disillusioning church experience. It could be the, the death of some dream that you've held for a really long time. Divorce, betrayal, a car accident, the inability to get pregnant, like, you know, like unrequited love, that kind of stuff. Um, at some level, it's always the loss of a dream that we had. Um, and so we all hit these. If you aren't already familiar with like what it's like to hit a wall, that means you are young and you will soon. Blast. <laughs> yeah, you're soon going to you're going to you're going to hit a wall soon. Um, and when they happen, we don't know where God is. Uh, we don't know what God is doing. We don't know where God is taking us. We don't know how we're going to get there. We don't know when it will be over. We don't know those things. Um, and this is also what people often call the dark night of the soul. So, uh, but we're mostly going to be referring to it as the wall tonight. So I wanted to look at a passage of scripture where Peter is hitting the wall. And Peter is like the disciple that Jesus invested the most in. And he, we're, we're, we're looking at him, he's deep in hitting the wall. And there's a lot that I can't get to, uh, but you need to know a little bit of backstory. So before this, Jesus had denied no, having known Jesus. Uh, Peter denied having known Jesus three times the night that Jesus was being murdered. Um, and so oftentimes pastors get that wrong, I think, and think that uh, that the reason that he's denying Jesus is he's like scared. But he's, like, he's like, oh, I don't want to get caught like being a part of that crew. That's not what's going on. Uh, if Peter had been scared, he wouldn't have sliced off a Roman ar uh, R Roman army officer's ear two hours earlier. Like when they're coming to take Jesus, he, he he's ready to go to battle, and he takes out the sword and goes after a Roman soldier. So he is definitely not scared. Um, what's going on is he's in despair because for three years he's been following this guy who he thought was the Messiah. Who he thought he was going to be on the ground floor of this revolution where they were going to overthrow the government and God was going to establish his kingdom on earth and that he was going to get to be the right-hand man for that. Um, and so he's in total despair, having gone from being a fisherman to being a disciple, this elevated spiritual role, to back now that guy is, is dead, right? And, and um, so it's this deep disillusionment with the project that Jesus had him on and it's, and it's despair. And um, so... Where we're, where we're meeting up with it, in, in John 21, Peter has gone back to being a fisherman, but he's gone back to it with a bitterness because it's like, 
or sin. Jesus came to him, uh, the, the first uh, meeting that Jesus had with him, he said, like, stop fishing for fish. I'm going to make you a fisher of people. Well, Peter's back to being a fisherman of fish. <laughs> and so he's back to the daily grind, but in a way where it's like, I saw this more beautiful future that I wanted to be my future that is now over. And I guess I just got to like submit to the bleak day-to-day -day grind. This is what my life will be. This is all that my life will be kind of a thing. And um, there's a callback going on where that, that happened right before this, where the first time that Jesus uh, meets him, tells him to put out their nets for, for a catch and get a huge catch of fish. Jesus comes back in the resurrected form and tells them to let down their nets and they get a huge uh, amount of fish. And then Peter like freaks out, realizes it's Jesus on the beach, puts his clothes back on and then jumps into the water, which is something that shows that he's an overexcited person at that moment, um, because no one does that. Um, and then so then they, they get on the beach, they eat fish, and then we're, we're going to be reading this, but we're specifically like asking, how is Jesus addressing the fact that he's hitting his wall? And what does it t tell us about how God treats us as we hit our wall. Um, so go ahead and read it, and then we will discuss. No, no, no. Do you have the passage? I'll pass it around. So let's talk about it. Um, and I'm, I have some preformed questions, but I just know that my, my notes did not get as deep as the truth that's in this. And so I feel like the Holy Spirit's gonna open up the meeting in a way that I didn't prepare for. And I hope that we dig into this and, and see something new, but yeah. Knowing where Peter's at, why does Jesus approach him this way? I think it's so special that he does it in such a um, not intimidating way that he just like that he makes him breakfast like yeah. that. Just that I mean, imagine how he's feeling, Peter, of like, oh my gosh, I'm such a screw up. Like, what is wrong? Whatever. And then Jesus is just like, come sit with me. Like, that's so special and so gentle and so kind. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't seen a friend in a long time, too. You just, you just want to eat with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the callback, like you said, wasn't that the beginning of the whole ministry? When mm -hmm. Jesus was like, yeah. Yeah. And so it bringing to mind again, like, this is a new beginning. Mm -hmm. I get to meet Jesus again. 
Yeah. And like I remember how I called you three years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. With the, with the same yeah like miraculous catch of fish, and then um, and at that time so it is like because when he first called him he said um like I'm gonna make you a fisher of people. And so it, I just imagine Peter feeling like such a failure. And it's just really beautiful um, that Jesus is like, this is, this can still be your calling. Like you, I still want you to like yeah. love people. Um, so that would feel uh, just really gracious, you know, if I was Peter and I just was feeling so much shame. Yeah. Yes, he's like reigniting the dream that was dead, the despairing dream. But how has the invitation changed this time, like this time from the last time? Like, how is it different? Well, I think the first time he's saying, I will make you a fisher of people. Oh, yeah. And now he's saying, now is the time. Feed my lambs now. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's, it's here. It's yeah. Like, it's happening now. Yeah. yeah. And there's no, like punished like now and but before that you need to go and like right. all this stuff and like <laughs> repent and yeah and even just the uh the dignity that he gives peter of like i trust you it's pretty powerful yeah especially when the last words that peter spoke in scripture were i don't know who jesus is mm. while he's dying right yeah mm. And that there's another callback there, which is Jesus, Peter said that three times, and Jesus asked him this three times. Oh, yeah. I do wonder. Um, I had a question about because I know like Jesus changes his name, you know, from Simon to Peter, mm -hmm. and then here he repeatedly calls him Simon, son of John. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if why or if that was intentional. Did you? Oh yeah, yeah. I wonder if it's like he, when Peter denied Christ, he left the group, right? And Jesus is like now three times calling him Simon, bringing him back in. Like, okay, now you're Peter again. Like, now feed my lambs. Yeah, know. there's a bunch going on with the words there. Like, yeah, so the Simon thing, Simon means flimsy reed and uh, Peter means rock. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, in a way, he's accepting the frailness that Peter has to offer. Another thing that's going on in there is Jesus is saying, do you agape me? Which is like this pure hearted love. And Jesus and Peter keeps saying, I phileo you, which means I love you like a friend. Um, and then so Jesus says, do you phileo me? Do you agape me? He says, I phileo you. Jesus says, do you agape me? He says, I phileo you. Then Jesus says, do you phileo me? He says, I phileo you. So it's like Jesus is accepting the frailty of who Peter is and who Peter's broken now and understands like who he is mm -hmm. and what he can actually give Jesus. And Jesus accepts what he can give yeah. in this moment of woundedness and weakness. Yeah. Like still is calling him into mission. Because before Peter had a lot of uh, really brash sort of self-assuredness like yeah. he thought himself more capable than he was and he just was kind of blind to his own reality and so it's yeah he's he's come he's seen like his own limits and he's living within his limits yeah his yeah 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 dude's broken that's a that's a big aspect of moving through the wall we'll talk about that this is slightly off topic, but it's a question that popped up. It says this was the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples. Do we know, though, is this the third time or the first time that he's appeared to Peter? And we got that knowledge. I believe it's the third time he's appeared to the disciples in general. And I think it's the first time he's appeared to Peter. And some of these people. Yeah. Yeah. The he's first time he wrote to Emmaus, yeah. which was not the 12. Yeah, it was just two of them. It was yeah. James and John. Uh, nameless. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. John, I'm just looking at, I'm just looking back at chapters, and so this is just, um, in John, he, in John 20, uh, he comes to all the disciples. Jesus comes to all the disciples first. 
And then he comes back to all the disciples specifically to see Thomas because Thomas, that was oh, when yeah. Thomas was not in the yeah. room. So he addresses Thomas at that point. So that was. So was Peter in the room too, though? Mm -hmm. or if he yeah. Yeah. And I just hadn't talked about it yet. It was probably like an elephant in the room. You know what I mean? Oh, Peter was probably so uncomfortable those other two times. <laughs> and yeah. very, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's just like in times of trauma, it's just really easy, I think, for us or myself uh, to go back to what I know, like, you know, like when you're tanking, you just go back to old ways of operating, like old habits. Yeah. Um, it's hard to be hopeful and claim like all these, like maybe we feel like God's like spoken some awesome stuff to us and called us to more, but when trauma hits, it's just like, no, I'm going back to this, this old way of being. Um, and it's just, it's just sad. I mean, like, it's like, yeah, he's like, he's like, I guess I thought I was going to do this amazing stuff with Jesus and never mind. I failed at that. And I'm kind of sad that maybe Jesus failed too, but, um, now I'm just going to go back to like my old way of life, mm -hmm. like a fisherman, you know, um, it yeah. makes me think of, um, like how in the Old Testament, I can't remember who God makes the promise to. It probably was maybe Noah, but I can't remember. And how God holds up the, the both the ends of the covenant, like not just like one end of the covenant. So it's like he's making a covenant with him. He holds up both ends of the covenant so we don't have to. Um, and so in this, like when you like reference like the love and the, is it the Hebrew or Greek translation? Greek translation um, it's like Jesus is offering to hold up the end of it until maybe Peter's in a place where he realizes like yeah. the love I have is limited by my my humanity and mm -hmm. my my like my brokenness and my sin. Mm -hmm. And so like Jesus is like inviting him to be like, hey, this is we're in this together. Like this is a mutual love that's unconditional and stuff. And then yeah. and then saying, you know what, you're not there yet. So I'm gonna meet you where you're at. And David says like Peter was hurt. Yeah. And even mm -hmm. that like knowledge is like don't you realize Jesus does love you? Like what he did was for you. But I think it's, it's obvious Peter is still having a hard time understanding his role and that he yeah. doesn't have to do anything. Like he can obviously follow his commands, but there's just so much more to it that I think Peter is still having a hard time understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus like meets him where he's at. Yeah. I wonder if part of that disappointment is just because they were under such Roman oppression and you know they were thinking that Jesus would then be a king, the new king, and just their definition of king versus Jesus's definition of king. And so now he's died. And so clearly that's so just the disappointment in thinking that they'd be saved from this horrible Roman oppression and that just didn't happen. Yes. Yeah. So like what do you think Jesus is challenging when he says, Do you love me? Well, yeah, like, do you love what you thought I was going to do? Yeah. Like, do you love me, like, as king? Or do you actually love this this thing that you have no clue? Like, you have no clue. Oh, and then even at the end, he's like, you're basically, it's kind of like, you're probably going to die, Peter. I mean, Peter doesn't know that. But it's like, <laughs> do you love this life? Because this is very different yeah who you think i am this is the thing i really want us to notice about this and this is very key for like what the dark night of the soul or the wall is mm -hmm. um is he's challenging the idol of power for dominance in peter's heart mm -hmm. um he's saying like you thought that you were going to be a victorious disciple right hand guy all that's gone now i'm dead <laughs> right um like it's not gone gone but it's not there in the way that he expected he had a he had a picture for what Jesus was going to mean in his life and what his life was going to look like. And he is in despair about that picture going away. Um, and he's like, okay, now that that picture that you wrote for your life is over and gone, you still love me. Now that all the side benefits of like my shows of power and um, yeah, just the side benefits of the, the way that the, the idol of power was playing out for Peter, those are gone now. Like you still love me. This is what happens um, 
when we hit a wall is there are deeper idols that God is, is, is asking us, do you love the idol or do you love me? And sometimes he has to withdraw his presence and we have to have periods of dryness um, so that he can ask, do you love the way that worship song makes you feel or do you love me? Um, do you love the picture of yourself as a successful pastor or do you love me? Um, so St. John of the Cross, who wrote the book on the dark, he coined the phrase, the dark night of the soul, and he's the one that people always refer to uh, when talking about this stuff. He talks about how there's these seven uh, deadly idol sins, idols, sins, uh, that, that get exposed during the dark night. So the first is pride. Um, my life is supposed to go the way that I planned it, and it's not going that way. Um, this, is, this is the one that Peter's probably hitting. Uh, this is the one I'm, I'm probably hitting right now, and the wall that I'm like trying to get through and I've been trying to get through for 10 years but I'm really understanding <laughs> how I'm trying to get through it right now um but yeah God like don't you know that I was supposed to like I've been good at every other thing I've ever tried to do I'm supposed to like have a large church don't you understand that like we're supposed to start a bunch of house churches not just one like um and God's like well you don't have that do you love me what are you in this for like do you love me or do you love who you thought you were going to be if you followed me? Um, the second one, John, St. John of the Cross says, is avarice. They're discontent with the spirituality God gives them. They never have enough learning, and they're always reading books rather than growing in poverty of spirit mm -hmm. and the interior life. I can list at least four friends uh, that walked away from Jesus in conversation with this, that problem. What's the definition um, of avarice? Greed, greed. greed. Um, and actually, with all of these, I, I wrote down like friends and things next to them. Did you, did you see that on the list? No, no, but I'm just, yeah. I, and I was, I, I erased it later because I was like, this can't be on my paper. But, um, and even in this church, like we're caught at some of these walls and we're not, we're not going through them and we're not willing to. And one of the biggest questions that God has for us is like, are we going to go through this wall? Like, will He let us? Yeah, so luxury, they take more pleasure in the spiritual blessings of God than God himself. So God needs to withdraw the feelings and the emotion, right? Um, wrath, they're easily irritated, lacking sweetness, and have little patience to wait on God, getting impatient. Um, spiritual gluttony, they resist the cross and choose pleasures. Spiritual envy, they feel unhappy when others do well spiritually, and they are always preparing. And sloth. They run from that which is hard. Their aim is spiritual good feelings, right? So often when we experience a, a deprivation in our lives and a spiritual dryness, if you dig deeper, you're going to find some kind of idolatry that's being challenged. Um, like your inner life turns dark because you've been waiting and waiting for God to give you the like ideal partner and, and it's not happening. Um, and so what begins to happen is you begin to transfer your frustration about the idol letting you down onto God. And it makes sense why we transfer like that, because like, because it's like, um, we transfer because God is the architect of our lives. And so if life feels not worth living, then God is to blame. And then all these other things is the canary in the coal mine thing where Christian platitudes, Christian uh, truths start sounding like platitudes and they, we can't really resonate with them because life doesn't feel good because we're transferring the frustration that we have about this idol letting us down onto our relationship with our maker. Um, and when your deepest idol gets challenged, it can feel like you are dying because you so deeply identified with, with your idol that if you lose it, you feel like there's no, there's no reason to live anymore because it's what you're living for. Um, but it's actually, it's actually the pain of like the true you being born. It's not you dying. Um, it's your addiction to an idolatry that's dying, but it feels like death. Um, and I can, I, I can think of three people that have talked about it uh, in the last year. Of, uh, like this is going away and it feels like I'm dying, you know? Um, and so side note is like when Christian truths start seem to, like, s s seeming like platitudes, 
Uh, okay, I studied philosophy. I'm gonna toot my own horn here for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten to see some of the deepest thoughts that humans have ever come up with, right? Like, um, and a, a thought being deep basically means like, it's got a lot of explanatory power. It's got a lot of connections to other things. Um, for me in, in philosophy, like Kant's categorical imperative was, it was very, it had, it was deep. Like it has so many connections to other things. It's so elegant in the way that it expresses what morality is. Like, I love that thought. I played with that thought a lot, but it is not as deep as calling God father. Like I've seen with those two thoughts, how deep they can go and how much of my life they can touch. And we've all experienced like the, the idea that, oh, God's my father. What a platitude, like whatever, like what a corny thing to do, whatever, right? But no, like I've gotten this call God father and call God Papa, like I was talking about the other the week and just the layers of depth getting deeper and richer. Um, and so I just want to say like, it's semantic satiation. When, when Christian truths start to feel like platitudes, this happens a lot with like the afterlife or heaven. People are like, oh, like that's just such a platitude. Talk about that when somebody dies. That's semantic satiation. Um, it's losing its power to you, but it has not lost its power. <laughs> a platitude is like, like somebody dies and you're like, they're in a happy place now. And then, but or, you, like or just cliche. It means yeah, like cliche. cliche yeah um and then semantic satiation she knows that one she just defined it for us it's Ted Lasso <laughs> um, semantic satiation is where a <laughs> word loses its meaning because you said it so many times um yeah but and then but the deeper thing that I'm trying to get at is that a lot of times under that if you look deeply at why you're not able to your heart is not able to jump into a simple truth like God loves me. Like we sing, like we're gonna sing later tonight. And, and if you're like, oh my gosh, like these people are like crying over here about like, he loves me, oh, he loves me. Um, there might be transference going on where you're frustrated about something and there's an idol that's letting you down and it's making you, you're giving your heart distance from these deeper truths about God. Um, anyway, uh, God, here's another thing I want to say is God changes us more deeply at the wall and he gives us, he gives us a deeper well of himself than we can get any other way. Um, and we totally see that in this passage, right? Like where Jesus and Peter have gotten in their love is deeper here because of the despair that he's going through. And he had to go through that despair. And God had to withdraw, like Jesus had to physically withdraw and die um, for him to confront that idol. He wasn't going to confront it if Jesus had just been around healing people the whole time, right? Um, and so, we, yeah, when we persevere patiently through suffering, there's a temptation to ditch. There's a temptation to retreat, to not change, um, to write it off as, as cliches. Uh, but if we move forward, open and listening to God, God is going to put some new part of his heart inside of us. And it's going to mark us moving forward in our life. And, and, and we will be changed. And it will be a new part of God's heart in us. Um, yeah. I, hmm. The cross means that God draws near to us in pain. And the way that the cross works is letting God start to hold your pain. And so you have to hit a wall to be able to do that, like to experience the power of the cross. Um, and I, and I, I, I was like praying earlier this week about, um, yeah, just the, my, the thing I'm always frustrated about that we haven't been able to start more house churches as quickly as I wanted. And um, I was like, God, can you t please like take away the sadness that I have that about not just like that we haven't grown quickly, but also like the sadness about like the state of spirituality in the city and. Um, yeah, well, to that because we went to um, we took our daughters to like a Sunday school the other week at a church that was like really big and popular, 
prior to COVID. And when we went there, we were like, oh my ghost gosh, time. there's like not that many people here. And then you met with pastors that were experiencing similar things. So it, so it kind of was yeah. just like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, we're having a hard time, but like, it was just depressing. Like, does anybody like believe in Jesus anymore? <laughs> like, anyway. Yeah, like these put together older pastors were just like, yeah, I just want to drive Uber for the rest of my life because I'm just realizing like church is dead. <laughs> um, I mean, they were in the, the wall. <laughs> they're in the wall. <laughs> You're going to get through it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was just praying and I was like, God, can you take away the sadness that I have about where things are at? Because it's pretty crippling. And God said, I can't take the sadness away from you because it is my heart. Like I'm giving you more of my heart. So you, I, to take that away would be to take away my heart. Um, but then I was like, well, then where's the light, easy yoke that you promised? And he was like, you need to stop carrying it with your ego and start carrying it with the cross. Um, and that, that really got me, you guys. Like, um, yeah, it's, there were like four things I was sad about that I just stopped being sad about um, in the same way. Like, I, it, I was realizing that the pain that I have is actually more deeply God's than it is mine. Um, and there's, there's like a, yeah, you have to hit a wall for God to come and carry pain for you. Um, yeah. And, 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 and to hear and to have this deeper exchange with God, where it's like, do you really love me or do you love the side of the right? So and go ahead. Like with that, I, the, one of the things that keeps like bouncing around my head as you're saying that is I think to choose it in, in scripture and also I think in my own life, like the wall is also in different ways of we're talking about the wall, I guess, but like that there's also often a choice when you get there of like what you're gonna do with that information. Like I could and I am I am way interpreting outside of what we directly have like in the Bible itself. But like if you think about like the rich young ruler, like we don't know what his circum exactly what his circumstances were coming to Jesus saying like what do I have to do? Like I've done, I've kept all these commandments. Like, what do I actually have to do? Like, what, what more do I need to do? Like, in other words, I know there's something more I'm stuck. Like what I hear in his question is some aspect, some element of like, I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. What more do I need? There's something. Yeah, yeah, missing, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And so there's a stuckness that I connect a little bit with a, a little bit with a, a wall. Yeah. And like, Jesus is like, okay, well here, here's what you need. Like you have a choice. Of are you gonna like trust me over, you know, in his case, are you gonna trust me over money or not? And and he went away sad, right? Like so because he was trusting money more than Jesus. And I guess as I'm saying that, like I think sometimes too we do have a choice. Like we do get a choice of whether we're going to stay stuck stay stuck and because something in us at least for looking at, at like I've had, I've had a lot of walls a lot of different kinds of walls um and that like it felt like something had to die because something had to die yeah like it felt like death because something was actually dying in me yeah. that needed to die like and it was my reliance on whatever it was my you name it, like it was my, it was some kind of idol in my own heart or it was some kind of pillar or it was some kind of choice that I was frankly unwilling to make. And God's like, cool, like you get a choice about whether you want that, but like you will stay in the wall if you do not put this to death or you do not let this die with me on the cross. Like mm -hmm. you actually have to choose yeah. whether this is gonna die or not at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, that yeah I, I just just to name that like that I think there is a choice sometimes of like it feels like dying because somebody actually has to yeah um, for sure yeah. amen yeah it's kind of interesting because like all the gospels are 
like written for a specific purpose, whatever that may be. And like, the, I think John was written for Roman, or sorry, for Jews and the Greeks. And like, you know that both of them had idols that in their society were like, you do this, you get this, like follow, like follow this idol or that idol or, um, and it's just interesting because I think what's so unique about God, I think we try to put God in this box and compare God to all these other idols that like can bring temporary fulfillment or joy or things like that. And but this God like brings emotion that we can sit with and it's okay. Like we can like God meets us in our brokenness and says, like, it's okay that you're there, like then I can offer you so much. And I, I'm not like it's not with conditions. So I think that's the beautiful thing too is whether you like love me or not, like I still love you and I still forgive you. And I still want to walk with you. And I give you these emotions that are so painful to recognize me in my heart. So it's like, so it's so crazy. It's just like, dang, like it's like, it's like unbelievable. Like how does like, this God is not like any idol anywhere else. And even just like thinking back to like I listen to a lot of podcasts. That's why I know I'm like talking about all this stuff. It's like, I'm always listening to podcasts, but um, even just like going back to like Adam and Eve's story and how like they had that choice, right? Like God told them what to do and they didn't do that, right? Like they made a choice and it's kind of like, we have a choice to view God in abundance or in scarcity. Like I'm lacking something and when I'm lacking something, I want to make up for it. Mm-hmm. But if you recognize God brings abundance and more than we can ever imagine. It's a huge perspective shifting thing of like I don't need anything more because I already have everything. But sometimes you have to get to the wall when you realize you've been filling yourself with all these like temporary things or things that have let you down, and you blame shift to God of like God, why? Because you're limiting God in that box. But it's really interesting to think about idols because they're real. Yeah, we are in like somewhat in control of them, also living in a very addictive society. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So n- next question is why is Jesus not just say, do you love me and leave it at that, but then say, feed, feed my sheep. Mm-hmm. Why does it say, feed my sheep? So we need a purpose, right? Yeah. yeah. Jesus is like, don't just love me and keep fishing. He's like, love me and do the thing that you have meant to do. Yeah. yeah. And he Let- knows, like, I think. He- Go ahead. Oh, well, I think that deep, like, that's. Peter's desire yeah. is to be a fisher of men. And I think part of why he's so sad is that he's like, oh, I don't get to do that with yeah. Jesus anymore. Your idol dying is not just about detachment. It's about discovering the deeper desire that God has a calling on your life for. Right? Well, that's the trust, right? You got to yeah. trust enough to let the thing die and believe that nothing will be taken from you that truly makes your heart sick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we often yeah, yeah. think that that's, that we know, if I don't have this thing or this person or whatever. Even if that thing is your idea of what Jesus is, that yeah. needs to break it down. Which is exactly what happened here. Yeah, exactly. His, his idea of what got, so that is an, uh, uh, so this, this is a good time to talk about the four things that Pete Skizzer talked about. So one of them is what you just said, the mystery. Um, Somebody who has been through the wall is somebody who is comfortable with God being mysterious. Um, We like to be in control, but yielding to God means not being in control. And one of the ways that we try to control God is by thinking that we have a clear idea about who he is and what he will do. (laughs) Um, And we have to admit that God is so beyond any conception that we could ever have of him that most of the time we just have no clue what God's actually doing. And, and with that, um, within the mystery of God, there's this balanced awareness that many of the things that we see as victories will actually be spiritually dangerous for us. And many of the things that we see as defeats will actually be the thing that we need to grow in the way that God's invited us to grow. And so we get this, the mystery leads to this other thing, which is, okay, it leads to patience, right? So Abraham waited 75 years on God. Moses waited 40 years on God. They didn't even get to go in. David uh, is anointed by king by God, and then it's 13 years between then and when he actually becomes king. Even Jesus had to wait in the grave for three days. And so waiting is a sign of that you, that you have become um, 
somebody who's gone through the wall that you are able to be patient and wait right and still and carry hope yes like, it's not just wait, mm -hmm. it's not yeah it's with hope that god will speak eventually yeah and then and then detachments to the things of this world so uh first corinthians 7 29 through 31 says the time is short from now on those who have wives should live as if they don't those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they weren't, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. For this world in its present form is passing away. So somebody who's been through the wall is somebody that, that, that means we engage ski trips and meals and mortgages of this world. Um, always aware that these things are not our lives, um, that we are marked by eternity. And that's, that's why that's not a platitude, right? We're not controlled by the dominating power of things um, because we've been marked by God for eternity. And we detach from the world because we're attaching more deeply to God and more deeply to the true desires that are, are in us, that God put in us, right? Um, and then what else? I'm, there's others. I, oh, oh, broken. Somebody who's been through the wall is broken. They're humble. They don't judge other people because they've seen enough of themselves that they're not going to be judging other people. They're not touchy because if somebody ever brings up a criticism, it's like, oh, oh it's like, you don't know how right you are. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I have that problem deeper than you're ever going to see, right? Um, and then I, I wanted to add, I think people who have been through the wall have a childlike joy and a willingness to just gratitude, like see a sunset as like a personal love letter from God. Uh, there's this, yeah, childlike joy and um, like platitudes and, and cliches and stuff like that. One man's trash is another man's treasure. And yeah, one man's platitude is a broken man's deep well of life, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the most important one, I'm going to do a callback to the most important one is just when Jesus says, do you love me more than everything else? Like, do you love me that you can just honestly say, yes, like, God, I love, I love you for you. Um, yeah. So we have, we have some reflection questions. Obviously we got to spend some time thinking about what are the walls we've been through or that we're maybe even going through right now? Um, and then if there's time after, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have the, the uh, discussion part be during dinner um, this time. We're just going to worship and then we'll break. And then the first conversation that you have at dinner can be just like what you were thinking about during the reflection. Yeah. Thank you.
watches over our souls, that tenderly cares for us, and that you alone hold the words of life. To whom else shall we go? So Holy Spirit, still our hearts before you.
Has it, has it made the rounds? <laughs> we'll, we'll do brother while we're, while we're doing that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seth has to play that. Yeah, you got to play that one. Oh, but, I, I, I'm so out of tune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 